Um, next we have Debra. And Debra has been friends with Brandon for a long time now. Brandon always says that Debra has some of the most amazing stories um, that you've ever heard in your whole life. And that there's so many of them that it gets to the point where you're not even sure whether you should believe them anymore. There's like that many from one person's life. What Debra wants you to know is that she's a Florida native and that she's the oldest of nine children. Six brothers and two sisters. And when she was born, she was a preemie. And the physician told her mom, you know, like, this is a miracle and you'll never have any more. <laughs> and then she had six children and twins at some point. And so, um, but, but when you hear Deborah's story, I think you'll understand sort of the, the magic and the miraculousness around her, her life and appreciate and love her for that. So you're in for a treat. Imagine you have just run for three hours and 57 minutes, 26.2 miles, and you just came across the finish line. Can you imagine? Some of you I know have the, the triumph and the glory that you and your body just ran a marathon. I run a few. I know that feeling. It's something else. Or... You work on a tall ship, you know, like an old pirate ship with all those tall masts. The brig unicorn, two-masted, it's a brig, with all these square soles, 17 sails overall. And you're climbing in the rigging. You have to furl or set the sail. You're climbing in the rigging. Now it's rough seas, and it's pitching. The boat's pitching fore to aft, and the boat is rolling starboard to port. Uh, port. And so you're climbing in the rigging. You're going to set the sail or furl it. And you, it's pitching. And you wait till it rolls this way. And you climb, 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 climb. Then you hang on for dear life. And you wait for it to roll again. And then you climb, 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 climb. And, and you go up. And you and there's just little footholds out there. You put your feet all around in the rigging. And then you lower the sail if you're setting or you're furling the sail under your stomach, and you wrap it all up? Or can you imagine you're in a dance troupe, and you get to dance with this troupe for the Special Olympics Winter Games in Anchorage, Alaska, and you're on stage. And one more. How about firefighters, EMT firefighters? You live at the fire department. There are three of you that live there, volunteer fire department, Homer, Alaska, your own bedroom. The page goes off in the middle of the night. The siren is yelling, and they're, and they're telling you what you're going to go do. You jump into your firefighting boots, pull up the firefighting pants, put on the suspenders, run down the hall, slide down the pole. And down in the bay, you either put all this firefighting gear on or your ambul ambulance gear with all the gear in your pockets. And off you go. You're a first responder. If you need help, the rest of the crew, the rest of the volunteers will come and help you. They all have pagers, and they're all listening. I used to do all those things and many, many more. I can't do any of that anymore. You saw Brandon help me out to the stage. So. I just have a little message right here. If you have a dream in your pocket, go for it now, because none of us know tomorrow or even five minutes from now. And it's fun to have done a lot of your dreams and have them come true, because if something happens to you, you can stand tall. You've already had the experience, and it's OK. So go for it. What happened to me was, I was an RN. I worked alternative medicine. I loved it. I could give you anything I wanted, and I was never afraid that I was going to hurt you. It was the coolest medicine ever. Monday morning, 7.38 in Anchorage, Alaska. It's spring. It's October 11th. It's, 
it, I mean, it's fall, it's turning cold, pitch dark outside for two or three more hours. I open the car door to get in, the light comes on, and I get a glimpse of, an, of a head, a face, jumping out from behind the Jeep. And I see this face, and I'm like, my head just instantly said, they've seen me before. They knew exactly what time I came out here. I had two Jeeps. They knew which Jeep I was going to get into. They'd seen me before. Anyway, there was some kind of squabble. I don't remember, but my head, when you're in emergency medicine, when I'm in emergency my head tells me like an algorithm, do this, do that, do that, like that. So I know exactly what to do. My head said, start yelling now, immediately. And so I don't remember the squabble. I, don't see, I didn't see anything. I can't remember any of that. But there was a squabble. And I know my mouth was yelling. I don't know what it was yelling, but it was loud. This was a dark, quiet, quiet neighborhood street. Here's a loud mouth. The perpetrators want quiet. They want to do their thing and then flee. But here's a microphone voice yelling. And anyway, I didn't feel myself fall to the ground, but I was. I had fallen to the ground. And that's when I started assessing myself as a nurse. This hand wiggled around. All I could feel was pain in my head. And it was all sticky and bleedy. And well, I knew it was. But the thing was, mostly, is that I knew that I had that long to live. Not that long, that long. And that my only link to life, especially as an EMT, emergency, ER nurse, et cetera, my link to life was if those para professionals, the AMT, the, the um, paramedic could come and get me. That was my link. So my mouth is yelling as loud as possible, help! Call 911 immediately. I'm badly hurt. I need that 911. Call now. Help. Call 911 immediately. I'm badly hurt. And while I'm yelling, I'm assessing and figuring out what's wrong with me. I can't tell. Nobody's coming. I'm going to squeeze my way up the steps and try to go use my telephone in the apartment. I could not budge. Not even a speck. Just this hand. Fortunately, I'm right-handed. I couldn't move, but I had my mouth yelling, yelling, yelling. And pardon me, I have a brain injury, so sometimes I mess up. Uh, oh, sorry. We do it. We don't even have brain injuries. <laughs> Excuse me. Oh, so I'm yelling, yelling. Uh, eventually. Oh, that's what, I knew there was something special right here. While I'm waiting and I'm yelling, 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 I'm also aware of everything around me, the atmosphere, the ambience. There was a peace and a calm. And I can tell you, I know that when we're ready to leave the body, it's very easy for the soul to leave the body. It's peaceful. All you were going to, the soul's going to leave, leave that carcass behind. It's already finished. So it's peaceful, it's calm, there's not one thing to be afraid of. I know that, and y'all can take that with you. Anyway, so the ambulance, they did come, and as soon as I had one of them in my face, the firefighter, I said, please call my mother, Helen, and I gave him my phone number. Please call work, I gave them my phone number, because I no showed. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm imagining they're calling, you know, they, I don't think they ever did. But anyway, they, they got me, they're turning me on my back, on my side, they're stabilizing my neck, and you know how they turn you on the side to get the backboard under you, they did that, and here's my car keys laying in my face on the ground, and I'm like, you know what, they can have those car, the car, those can have the keys. I don't care. I don't even want it. You can have it. And then they got me all stabilized on the gurney. And they, when they lifted me up to put me in the ambulance, my nursing clogs fell off on the ground. And I'm like, you know what? I don't care. They can have them. I don't need them anymore. And they got me in the ambulance, and, and they were cutting off my clothes. And I heard them talking about what I had. And anyway, oh, I asked them for one more thing. I could hardly breathe. 
oh. I had so much pressure on my chest because I had a sucking chest wound. But remember, I don't know what happened. I don't even know why I'm hurt. I just know I squabbled with someone. So I had a sucking chest wound, and I heard them say sucking chest wound, and I imagined the bandage they put on. And, oh, when I got in the ambulance, I said, I can't hardly breathe. May I please have oxygen? And they gave it to me. And then I had done everything I could to keep my life here. These bodies are invaluable during these times. These are hard times right now, and our lives are invaluable. So then I got to go away. I just relaxed, went away. And all I know is that this is what I heard. Someone called my brother. He called the family. They gathered. They got a priest on the way, a few friends. They went to the ER and immediately knelt down and started praying. And the heavens were stormed with prayers for Deborah. Nobody in the world knew if I would survive. Nobody. And they worked on me. They breathed for me. They resuscitated me. They whatever. I don't even know what they did. And the next thing I know, at some point, and it, I think it had been days, I was in the intensive care, and I heard my brother one day whisper, Deb. Now, I'm intubated. My eyes have been damaged. I can't really see. I would not be able to tolerate these lights, and I can't handle noise. So the doctors must have known this, and they said, whisper. And they said, start low. Deb. Doctors say you've been stabbed three or four times. And I went, oh, that's what happened to me inside of my head. And then my brother, minutes or hours or days, I don't know, came back. Deb, doctor said you've been stabbed five or six times. And it went up seven or eight, nine or ten, ten times. So that's how I found out what happened to me. And then eventually I started coming out of the intubation and all that. And when I was in, I, I had a spinal cord injury in the neck, and I was absolutely paralyzed. I couldn't hold my head up. Nothing, except this hand wiggled. <laughs> and that was a giant blessing. But anyway, so when I was in ICU, and for a while there, all I knew was that I was in a cocoon. I could not feel any of this part of my body. It was just this little cocoon down there. It wasn't even big like this. And all I had were these eyeballs, maybe my third eye too, these eyeballs, and my breather. That was it. And I was in this cocoon, and that was all I knew was that I had this, and it was working. Anyway, I started progressing and progressing and getting better. Like one day, one day my pinky went like that this hand, and you can't imagine the joy to have that little thing, that little bit of movement when you didn't have it. Well, my sister and some of my family, my dad came up, they, everyone came from Florida, and they flew up to visit me, California, Seattle, they came from all over the country to visit me in the hospital, and, and word got around. And a doctor that I was a dental assistant for while I was in nursing school, he sent me a magazine article. Now, remember, I can't read really little words, but I could read the title. And it said, give thanks in all things. All, not just one or two things. So I, in my head, said, now I talk to God all the time in my head, and I said, Father. I say, Father, you, uh, that's just me, my perspective. I said, Father, I need a journal. I, I want to start a gratitude list. And this is my main message. So no one knew. Y'all didn't know. No one knew that I asked for that journal that morning, and I did. A friend, y'all already know this story, but a friend came to visit me, that I, a friend of the family that I'd never met in my life, and she brought art supplies, a big bag of presents. I love art. How do you know? She goes, well, I like art. Oh, thank you. And she brought me key lime cookies. She knew I was from Florida. And she pulls out a notebook, a spiral up here, long page notebook. I'm like, thank you, Father. I needed that. Like, how did she know? Here it was. So I started with my right hand writing, journaling, 
things that I was grateful for, and it could have been today, that you, those eyeballs came up today, all the way up here in this hospital. You have to walk far to visit someone. They came all the way up here and visited me. Or when I got out of the hospital, I'm with my sister-in-law. She's got four little ones. And she took the time out of her busy day to undress me, get the water right, sit me on a shower bench. And I had clean hair and clean. Can you imagine that? Oh, that feeling of cleanliness. It's not like now we can, I, you know, we can do it whenever we want. But then it was once or twice a week. And that's a wonderful. Thank you. And then the last thing that happened, I have to share this with you. And I have one more minute. The last thing that made a pivotal point in my life, pivotal change, was all of a sudden at the bottom of this long gratitude list, full page, I said, oh, Father, I'm so thankful for what happened to me, that I was given another opportunity to live to clean the dust and the cobwebs out of my life so I can go where I want to go after here. And once I said thank you to my new situation, I cannot go back to yesterday and change it and do those things that I used to do. I can't. This is me now. Once I said thank you for this, it gave me contentment. And there is no greater treasure than contentment. And so I highly recommend Gratitude List. And I have a quote for you to end on from our greatest challenges come our greatest blessings. <laughs>